A bird's life in Wales must be wonderful. A life made in heaven. Anything but. Birds have to work from dawn to dusk to find food and water. If they don't, they die. They have to battle with the elements too. Survival, especially during winter, is always difficult. And during the spring, they're busy raising families. They also have to put up with us and find a way of surviving in our artificial landscape. In this series, I'm going to be finding out what a bird's life is really like in Wales. I'm going to be discovering the vast array of species we have here, and I'm going to be probing into their secret lives. The uplands above Llamberis, and a ring oozel is collecting food for its chicks, which are hidden somewhere on the mountains. It's related to a blackbird, and looks like one, except for its prominent white bib, its distinguishing feature. It's flown all the way from the Atlas Mountains of Morocco to spend the summer in this part of Gwynedd. It can probably carry more in its beak than I could with my hands. And of course, as they have no arms, beaks are very important for birds. They come in all shapes and sizes. And they're used in different ways. beak is a very useful tool that birds have that other animals don't. They also have many other fantastic features that are unique to them and can do extraordinary things such as fly. They're very special living beings and in this program I'm finding out how their different forms allow them to do what they need to do to survive in the Welsh landscape. It's midwinter on the Nevern estuary in Pembrokeshire, and an egret and a spoonbill are feeding on the mud. The spoonbill is the one on the right, and although they're both feeding in the same habitat, their bills have completely different shapes, which allows them to feed in different ways. It's fascinating with these two birds because they're very similar, but yet they're very different. You know, they're both quite big white birds, long legs, quite a long beak, but you watch them feed. The little egret has got more of a, of a dagger-like bill and he'll walk along, he'll dart out looking for a fish here and there. The spoonbill, on the other hand, has got this huge spoon-like bill and he just opens it and he works his way through the mud like this and it's hypersensitive, so when he feels uh, invertebrates or fish or what, whatever's in that mud, all of a sudden it'll shut and then he eats and then it puts it back in again. So even though they're both in exactly the same spot, they're feeding in very different ways. It may be that the reason why the egret is staying so close to the spoonbill is because the spoonbill, through its actions, is disturbing the mud and releasing food into the water. This is precisely what the egret does when it feeds alone. It uses its feet to loosen the mud. And this releases shrimps and other invertebrates into the puddles, which makes them easier to catch. The Seven Estuary and the Newport Levels near the mouth of the River Usk.
Wetlands and estuaries are fantastic places to see the range of techniques wading birds use to catch their food and the tremendous range of beak sizes. These are the wet lagoons of Goldcliff on the Newport Levels. It's first light and one of Wales' rarest breeding birds is feeding. It's an avocet and it must have the most ornate beak of any Welsh bird. It uses it to sift the water for small insects and worms. It's high tide during a very wet winter period and the land has flooded. These wet fields are at Unis here. Because of their position next to the Dovey estuary, they too attract a great number of waders. High tide is the best time to come to Unis here because once the rising sea water has covered the whole estuary, then the birds come over the seawall in their thousands and they'll settle in some of these wetter fields and shallow lagoons here. The wet lagoons are excellent feeding sites, especially during the winter when the fields are waterlogged. One of the prettiest birds you find here is the lapwing. It has a small stubby beak and large eyes with excellent vision to help it catch small grubs on or near the surface. A red chunk can go slightly deeper to find invertebrates with its long beak. And a dunlin can go just as deep. But the ultimate wading bill belongs to a curlew. It can go deeper in the mud than any other estuarine bird to find its food. Curlews migrate from Europe to Wales in their thousands during winter and they join thousands more of different species on our estuaries. The variety of beak shapes allows the different species to exploit different parts of the habitat yet still live on the same estuary. Woodland and garden birds also have a variety of beak designs that allow them to exploit the same habitat. This woodland is in the Conway Valley. One of the commonest birds you find here is the chaffinch. It has a short, strong beak that allows it to eat seeds. A bluted, small, pointed beak is ideal for picking off small insects and in a conifer woodland for extracting small seeds from pine cones. In the spring, migrants from Africa, such as the willow warbler, arrive in our woodlands. They too have thin pointed beaks for eating insects. Also during the spring, bullfinches use their stubby beak to eat fresh shoots. In the autumn, a goldfinch's strong beak is ideal to pick off the seed heads of dying plants. But the most specialist seed eater of all is the crossbill. They literally have bills that cross over each other, and they're shaped that way so that they can prise open pine cones. Birds do what seem to be odd things sometimes, but they always have a purpose. One of the best places to watch bird behaviour is in a town. Here they're so used to people, they perform in full close-up view. This gull is on the seafront overlooking Colwyn Bay. Look at this herring gull over here. <laughs> it's quite comical really. She's running on the spot, looks like an athlete warming up. 
force is actually doing is um, mimicking rain falling on the earth and the earthworms then in the soil think it's raining it's going to flood i've got to get out of my burrow so they come up and if you watch in a minute she'll pick up the earthworms and feed them so it's funny it looks really silly but it's very effective The shape of a bird's foot changes considerably depending on what the bird does and where it lives. A heron and mohen walk on wet ground, so they need big feet to stop them sinking. Geese and ducks spend a lot of their time in water, so they need webbed feet to help them swim. Webbed feet are also handy as brakes when landing. Tree creepers and woodpeckers spend a lot of their time climbing trees. So they have strong thumbs to give them added support. A blackbird uses its feet to perch mainly. House sparrow and wren have the tiniest of feet, which can grab the smallest perch. Birds of prey need to use theirs to catch prey. They also use their beak to tear flesh. Feet and beaks are useful tools for birds. And a herring gull's beak has another important feature. It can be used to signal. The red dot against the yellow bill stands out and chicks can see it clearly. This gives them a target to peck at and stimulates the adult to regurgitate food. Puffin bills are also used as signals, and they're the most brightly coloured beaks that you'll find in Wales. Puffins nest in burrows, and this colony is on Scomer Island off the Pembrokeshire coast. The beaks are big because they use them to catch fish, but again they've been adapted to double up as signal devices. Outside the breeding season, the beaks are not brightly coloured. But during courtship, they're stunning and are used as attractive tools by the males and females. We have many colourful birds in Wales. Amongst woodpeckers, the green woodpecker is the most handsome. Even one of our commonest crows is striking. Though not a particularly popular bird, because it preys on small chicks and generally makes a nuisance of itself when raiding litter bins. Close up, its plumage is beautiful. A jay is even more striking. The detail and variety of colour and patterns on its feathers are startling. So why is a bird like the jay so colourful? Well, just look at this environment, a big, dense woodland like this. And woodland birds need to attract and keep a mate, and they also need to keep other male birds away. And they do that in one of two ways. Either they sing tunefully, like the blackbird, or they can be really colourful. But in the case of the jay, it uses both. Very colourful bird, and it's got a, not a tuneful song exactly, but a, this screech that carries a long, long way. So both of those act as a warning to other males and to attract females. Shh. 
Some birds live in very hidden habitats, and the males need to stand out to attract a mate. This is Cosmiston Lake near Cardiff. It's a site of an old stone quarry, which is surrounded by reeds. It's virtually impossible to see any small bird in the thick growth. But living here is one of our most spectacularly patterned birds. It's a male bearded tit. It's also one of our rarest breeding birds. Because he's small and agile, his colourful plumage isn't a great disadvantage, as he can soon fly away if a predator is about. But a few miles from Cosmiston, a bigger and less agile bird has to be less conspicuous in a similar habitat. This is Hendra Lake in St Melon, squeezed between Newport and Cardiff, and it's, um, it's one of those places you find every now and again in Wales, which is surprisingly good for birds. And I say surprisingly good because you've got houses all around, you've got a really busy railway line over here, and yet in winter it attracts an incredible variety of birds. And it's also a good place to see bitterns. Now, bitterns are a really shy, quite rare, brown heron. They like staying in the reeds and they don't like coming out at all. And they've got everything they need here. You've got reed beds that are full of fish. And because the reed beds are not very dense, they don't go far back, they're just a narrow strip. It really is one of the best places in Wales to see the bitten. In a more extensive reed bed, this view of a bitten would be very rare indeed. It will be hidden deep within the reeds. But here, you can watch it clearly stalking its prey. In the winter, it hunts for fish. In the summer, it will supplement that with insects and frogs. Once inside the reeds, it's perfectly camouflaged. Any sign of threat, and it raises its head to look like a reed. One thing that birds can do better than any other living being, they can fly. And they have many different flying techniques. One of the best places to see birds flying is on the coast. They use the wind as it blows off the sea and lifts over the land. South Stack on Anglesey is a particularly good sight. On the high cliffs, you can watch the birds at eye level. The wind is so strong, gulls and ravens can simply glide here with very little effort. They are two very different birds with different shaped wings. But the end result is the same. They fly smoothly. But why do gulls and ravens have different wing shapes? It's because they naturally lead very different lives. Gulls have pointed wings designed specifically for sustained gliding. Ravens generally live more inland and soar and circle high up above the ground. For this, they need more control, which they get from their slotted wings. This extra control also allows them to be more playful. One of our most dramatic birds on the wing can be found along the coast near Llandidno on the cliffs of the Little Orm. See that bird then? That's a fulmar. 
It's kind of a, a Welsh version of an albatross, really, and it's one of our supreme flyers. Spends nearly all of its life out at sea. It comes onto these cliffs here to nest and nothing else. Over the winter, it's right out on the open ocean. And if you look at the wings when it comes past again, they're long, thin, very stiff wings. And those are adapted, here's another one just coming past now. And those are adapted for life out at sea because they can make the best out of any little bit of wind hitting the waves. They'll skim over them and move like this, completely effortless. And there are thousands of miles of ocean out there. And it's important that they use as little energy as possible. And that's why the wings look like they do. There's another one just down below me now, skimming along the rocks here. Completely effortless, completely effortless. Gliding is the simplest form of flight. Fulmars are the best gliders of all of our birds. They hardly flap at all. The wings only need to twist in response to the different wind speeds above the sea. If there isn't any wind, they can soon produce it themselves by flapping gently using their wingtips. They also flap their wingtips when they need to slow down and stall when landing. Buzzards need a different kind of control for what they do. They're often seen soaring high above the land, scanning for food. For this, they need long, broad wings curved to provide maximum lift. They ride columns of air rising from the land and smooth out any turbulent air with their slotted wings. Some birds, like the buzzard and the red kite, glide or soar using the air. Other birds, like egrets and herons, produce their own powered flight by constant flapping. Many of our smaller birds generally spend little time in the air. They simply need to make short flights from one perch to another. They also live in different habitats, which have different flying problems. In a woodland or garden, birds need to be able to take off quickly to avoid danger and need to be very manoeuvrable to avoid trees and other objects. Bird's control of fast takeoff and landing can only be appreciated when it's slowed down. The way these great and blue tits coordinate their feet and wings for takeoff and landing is astonishing. A coal tit is just as skillful. Tremendous power that's required to shift air on takeoff is clearly shown by fully flapping wings. Waders don't necessarily need a quick takeoff, but need faster, sustained speed for long distance flying, especially as many migrate long distances. Some of our power flyers have evolved wings to enable them to produce aerobatic displays. Lapwings have very developed primary feathers on their wingtips, which gives them fantastic control. 
and they use this remarkable ability in their courtship display. There are also other specialist flyers in Wales. These are Arctic terns on the skerries north of Holyhead. They have long tails to give them extra agility. They can also hover by pushing the air backwards and forwards. They need these abilities to help them keep an eye on their eggs and chicks in this big colony during the breeding season. They also make the longest migration trip of any living creature and travel from here to the southern hemisphere as far as the Antarctic every year. Kestrels hover in a different way. This one is hunting on the forehead near Carnarvon. It stays in one position by flying at the same speed as the wind blowing against it. It too uses its tail for control. Like all of our birds, it's perfectly designed for a life in Wales. Look at this magnificent view. And to me, this just about epitomizes Wales. This mixture of hills and fields, of hedgerows and woodlands. And I don't think enough of us really appreciate the fact that we live in a fantastic country. One that's packed full of all kinds of habitats. And in each and every one of those, whether we take notice or not, the birds are getting on with their secret lives. Mm -hmm.